Okay, good afternoon. Um, it's time for, for us to get started. Uh, so in our previous lecture, we, we started uh, this lecture six part, part two, in which we were discussing different uh, systems that are part of uh, the design of a facility. And in our previous lecture, we were focusing on the electrical and lighting systems. So we, we went through uh, the explanation of how to determine the number of lights uh, that are needed for a specific uh, type of facility. Um, and you observed that there were many, uh, many tables that were used in the process, were determining different coefficients. And then at the end, all those coefficients were used to compute the, the need in terms of, of lighting for the system. Uh, so today we're going to transition to a, a different type of system. And after completing this lecture, we're going to talk about personal requirements, uh, meaning that those other, um, let's say, systems that are part of a facility that are needed for the personnel, like for the employees. Uh, we're going to talk about designing a parking space for the employees and also designing an office, for instance. Uh, so, so that's what we're gonna be discussing today. Uh, so let's let's get started. Any any questions? I know there was a homework due today. Hope everybody was able to, to submit. Um, and then there's gonna be a lab assigned today and that's going to be due at the end of the of the day uh, so uh, let's pay attention to that as well so life safety systems so these are the type of systems that are designed to control emergency situations that will disrupt the normal operation inside the facility and there are different type of events that might cause an emergency those include the fire seismic event or a pay power failure. Uh, fires are becoming very important, especially on that west side, California, uh, are having a, a major impact right now. Uh, we all experienced a power failure late last year with the uh, situation that happened in early last year uh, with all the snow and everything. So we know that those are things that can happen and we are not uh, necessarily uh, not affected by them. So we need to take those into account when designing a facility. Fire is the most per pervasive of the three and accounts for the majority of costs associated with disaster. Therefore, uh, fire resistance is critical in the design of any facility. So in terms of fire protection and safety, the first objective of the facility. That is not muted. For some reason. Yeah, that should, I mean, I have my computer mute. It's strange because uh, the volume in my computer is disconnected. Um, let's see. So construction type, um, 
first objective of the facilities planner is to determine sorry, uh, the building's functions and construction time as defined by the occupancy classification. And these occupancy classifications are based on the International Building Code or IBC. And there are listed here. Uh, there are multiple groups uh, and it depends on which type you are, uh, depends on the type of facility uh, that you are, are designing. So for example, theaters, educational facilities, uh, business, residential. So they will have a particular group uh, a classification based on the international building code. Uh, the type of structure also governs the degree of fire resistance. So fire resistance therefore refers to the ability of a structure to react as a barrier that will not allow the fire to spread from its point of origin. So if we got a fire inside the facility, we want to design a facility that's able to constrain that spread. Uh, so it's not going through the whole building. So something that we need to be aware of is that there's no such thing as a fire immune building. Uh, we know that those can, those things can happen. There's no way for us to be 100% sure that the fire will not happen within the facility. But facilities planner must be cognizant of the need to provide for uh, safety routes and as an integral part of the layout. Uh, most buildings require two or two or more exits. Actually, for most of the classrooms in this building, you'll see that you have at least two exits. Um, so also typically before COVID, now I haven't seen it this semester, we will have these fire drills and emergency drills. So people, will, that an alarm will sound in the building and you will uh, follow the instructions to get out of the building as soon as possible. So those are strategies that we can put into uh, place and we can manage those in order to be sure that we provide those safety routes and also a safety plan for our occupants. Uh, most local building codes will require the maximum allowable time or distance to exit the building, not be violated. So for example, you will have a predetermined uh, distance and you have to provide a, an exit from point from that point to the, the, the closest door. And that being no point can be more than 200 feet from an exit. 250 uh, feet in a building with sprinkles and up to 400 feet in a building with early suppression, fast response, fire protection and automatic smoke and heat vents. So depending on the level of uh, security and the level of preparation that you put into the building, you will have a specification in terms of the farthest door that could be from any point inside the facility. So again, if no safety protection is in place like sprinklers or, or early suppression, then the farthest door from any point in the facility should be 200 feet. Uh, if you have Sprinklers, then 250 and 400 if you have a suppression fast response fire protection. So if you wanna design for a less number of doors, you have to make sure that you provide all these systems as part of your design. Um, this table is providing some additional guidelines uh, this is a maximum floor area allowance per occupant. Um, so depending on the type of use for the building, you will have the floor area per occupant in terms of feet square. So again, you don't want to keep as many people in depending on the type of industry that you are working on. Uh, so for example, an agricultural building uh, floor area per occupant about 300. Um, the assembly 15, assembly with feet seat about 11. Um, business areas about seven, 100, I'm sorry. Um, classroom area about 20 feet. Um, 
net, and, and so on. So again, guidelines that we will follow in order to make sure that we satisfy those requirements for uh, fire hazards. Uh, the minimum number of exits for, for, for occupant load, if you have 500 or less, minimum two between 500 and 1,003 over 1,004. Um, and then the IBC remoteness requirements, two exits or exit access doorways, where two exits or exit access doorways are required from any point of the exit access, the exit doors or exit access doorways shall be placed a distance apart equal not to less than one half of the length of the maximum overall di diagonal dimension of the building or area to be served measure in a straight line between exit doors or exit access doorways. Interlocking or scissor stairs shall be counted as one exit startway. So it doesn't matter if you have more than one in that stair, it will be counted as one. So again, very important, not only to provide the specific system for uh, make sure that the fire doesn't spread, but also that you design to provide an exit for your occupants that is between the specified code or building code. And that will be the end in terms of life safety systems. Now we are gonna to transition to the personal requirements. Hmm. I think I moved one of the slides. Do you want it to be? There we go. So as I mentioned, the building design involved many systems. Um, now we're gonna be looking at some of the systems that are there for to satisfy those requirements of the employees. And this is a lecture that is associated with the first objective for this class to develop an understanding of the principles of facility location, layout and material handling systems and to practice designing facilities. So the agenda for today in, in this lecture uh, we're going to give an introduction and then we're going to talk about the employee as part of the facility. Uh, we're going to talk about designing restrooms, the office uh, facility planning, and also uh, barrier free compliance. Um, some of the objectives is learn how to plan for some of the personal requirements into a facility, including the parking, the restroom, and the office spaces. Uh, so why is this important? The planning of personal requirements include planning for employee parking, locker room, restrooms, food services, drinking fountains, and health services. Very important. If you keep your, your employees safe, if you keep your employees happy, if you provide all for their needs, then they should have a better and more productive employee. Person that is safe doesn't incur in um, or is not injured a lot. So you will have that person in the facility more time. Um, so in addition to care for, for their safety, we are also making sure that we, we have our employees in the facility as much as possible. So the facilities planner must integrate barrier-free design in addressing the personal requirements of the facility. We have to pay attention also for the needs of, of people with some type of disability. So the employee facility interface, an interface between an employee's work and non-work activities must be provided. So for example, providing space for them to store their, their equipment or their clothes if they need to change during the work uh, shift, 
or just to provide some, some space for them to put their, their belongings and make them safe. So these interface functions as a storage area for personal property of the employee during work hours. Personal property in, typically includes the cars and the employee's personal belongings, such as coats, clothes, purses, and lunches. So even though this is not directly connected with the processes or manufacturing processes that are um, part of the product that we are producing, these are relevant uh, systems or interfaces that we need to make sure that we design for. So we need to provide for space for, for the employees to, to park their cars and also space for them to put their belongings. So if they bring lunch to, to work, you have to provide a space for them to store their lunch, uh, maybe microwaves or, or a kitchen for them to be able to, to have lunch during the day. And also if they are working and bringing their clothes, their purses, they need a space to, to put those in, in the facility. So when we talk about the employee parking, we have a procedure that we can follow in order to design it. Uh, the procedure to plan for parking lot is the following. We first determine the number of cars to be parked by type of car. So are we gonna be planning for mostly compact cars or regular size cars? Um, do we need to plan also for vehicles that have uh, wheelchair accessibility? So we need to know how many of each or at least an estimate of the number of cars that we're gonna have per type. Determine the space required per, per car. Determine the available space for the parking. And then determine alternative parking layouts for alternative parking patterns. If you think about the parking spaces that you typically use, let's say in the, um, the university or um, I don't know if you go to any stores, you'll see that there are different layouts uh, if you have pay attention, some of them are diagonal. Some of them allow you to go in both directions. Some of them only allow you to go in one direction. So those are things that are planned for a reason. Uh, maybe it's to save space. Maybe it's to make sure that the flow of the car is going in a specific direction uh, and so on. So based on the alternative parking layouts, we're going to make a decision in terms of what will be the best design for the space that we have available and also for the, for the type of uh, facility that we are working on. Select the layout that best utilizes space and maximizes employee convenience. So when I was uh, working for Johnson & Johnson, they have a parking design in, in such a way that people can just leave as fast as possible. The reason why is, they had any type of emergency, they wanted to be able to get people out as, as soon as possible. So one of the things they asked us to do was to, to park our cars in reverse. So people will go into the cars and will be able to, to leave fast. Um, and I think that's, that's common practice in, in companies that are dealing with uh, chemicals or some type of uh, chemical process. Uh, the number of parking spaces to be provided must be specifically determined for each facility and must be in accordance with the local zoning regulations. Although minimum requirements can be as low as two handicapped spaces per 100 parking spaces, five handicapped spaces per 100 parking spaces is not uncommon. So we need to make sure that at least two spaces, handicapped spaces are provided per 100 spaces in this uh, parking facility. The size of the parking space for a car, for, which is expressed as the stall width times the stall depth can vary from 5.5 by 12 feet to 9.5 times 19 feet. And we're gonna have obviously some guidelines uh, depending on the size and the type of car that you are going to design for. Uh, the total area required for a park 
car depends on the size of the parking space, the parking angle, and the aisle width. So those three things are relevant and that will tell you the area required for a park car. So figure one shows the recommended range of stall width in feet for various car types and uses. So the width is here at the top. So for a small car, we have up to eight feet. All day park use between eight and 8.5. Standard car use between 8.5 to, to nine. Luxury and elderly use between nine and 10. Supermarket or and camper use between 10 and 11. And handicap use is between, I mean, plus minus 12. Um, the factors to be considered in determining the specification for a specific parking lot are first, the percentage of cars to be parked that are compact cars. 33% of all parking is often allocated to compact cars. So here in the university, you'll see that on the multi-level uh, parking buildings, some of them are allocated just for compact cars. Uh, so up to 33% is often, often allocated for compact cars. Increasing the area provided for parking decreases the amount of time required to park and depart. So more area, more space for you to maneuver, faster you can go in and out from the parking. Um, so that's something also to take into account. Angular configurations allow quicker Turnover, perpendicular parking often yields greater space utilization, although it also requires wider arcs. So if you have an angle, typically you will see a one direction uh, parking uh, lane. If you have a perpendicular angle, most of the time you have to provide a two way direction. So that will require a wider aisle for the, for the lane. As the angle of the parking, Space increases, so does the required space allocated to the aisle. So here's some guidelines. This is for single and double loaded modules options. So in here we have four modules. Those are named W1, W2, and W3, and W4. They are different in terms of their configuration. So for example, W1. It's called the single load wall to wall. So single load because it only has spaces on, on one side of the aisle and it has a wall on both sides of the, of the lane. So a wall here and another wall here. The double loaded or W2 is a double loaded wall to wall with con uh, continuous concrete curve. So again, the only difference between W1 and W2 is now that you have spaces on both sides of the aisle, but you still have this wall on both sides of the both sides of the of the um, lane, and you also have a curve here. Um, in the between the wall and the and the parking space. W3 or W3 is double load wall to uh, CL. So the wall is here. And then in this part, you see there's no wall. It's just lines uh, for for separation. So that saves you some space, will allow you to include more cars if you repeat this uh, configuration multiple times. Um, and then the double loaded wall to edge. Uh, so here's the same configuration, but you have this walk edge now 
between the, the lanes or in between the spaces in two separate lanes. So all, again, everything depends on, on, on what you are designing for. Um, it's not uncommon to see one of these walkways. Like if you go to a, a store like Walmart or Target, you'll see that some, some of the lanes will have those uh, walkways. Um, so it's not uncommon, but you will not see it in every, every single lane. You will see it in, in specific lanes. Um, so these are the four configurations that we're gonna be working with in, in terms of the, the designing a, a parking space. Uh, so theta is the parking angle. So let me define that. PW is the parking width. So that's what we are illustrating here. SW is the stall width. So it's this dimension here. So one dimension is perpendicular. This one is vertical. I'm sorry. So you see here you parking with this, this vertical lines and this one is perpendicular. And at an angle of 90 degrees, the sine of 90 degrees is one. So PW is gonna be equal to SW. So the parking width is gonna be equal to the stall width. As the parking angle decreases, PW or the parking width increases accordingly. So that's gonna be given by this formula. So the parking width is gonna be equal to the stall width divided by the sine of the. So here's some of the uh, guidelines. This is the module width for each car group as a function of a single and double load of module. So here we have the stall width, right? So SW, we have the, the module number. So W, remember W1, W2, W3, W4. So per module, W1, W2, W3, W4. And here we have the angle of the part. So 45 degrees up to 90 degrees. And then depending on the type of car, you have the group of small cars, standard cars, and large cars here on slide 15. So depending on the type of car that you're designing for, the stall width and the module and the angle, you will know what will be the module width that you're gonna be designing for. So the module basically is things that will be required for all this. Okay, so that will depend on the angle, the, the type of, of design that you're gonna follow, the stall width, and the type of car that you're gonna be designing for. So using the information from figures one, two, and table one, the facilities planner can generate several parking layout alternatives. The goal is to optimize the space allocated for parking and maximize employee convenience. So let's look at one example. Okay, so in this example, we have a new facility is to have 200 employees. A survey of similar facilities indicates that one parking space must be provided for every two employees and that 40% of all cars driven to work are compact cars. 5% of the spaces should be allocated for the handicap. The available parking lot space is 100 feet at 180 feet wide and 200 feet deep. Assuming no walls and no walking edge, determine the best parking layout using a stall width of eight feet, six inches for standard cars. Okay, so there are multiple things here that we need to, to capture in order to understand 
our design. So we have 200 employees. And the design is saying that we're gonna use one space for every two employees, right? So we're gonna be designing for a hundred spaces. Then 40% of all cars are compact. So 40 could be for compact cars. However, not all drivers of compact cars will park in a compact space. And you have seen that before. Uh, so therefore we can allocate less um, space to compact spaces because we know that not all compact cars will be parking on compact spaces. So we're gonna design for 30 compact spaces. Uh, begin the layout of the lot using 90 degrees double loaded two-way traffic because of its efficient use of space to determine if the available plot is adequate. From figure two, W4 is the required uh, module option. So go here. Um, so we said W4 is gonna be this one. And using W4 module and table 4.1, we can obtain the, the following information. So let's look at the information that we have. W4, we are designing for this. So for standard cars, I'm sorry, for small cars, we're gonna be looking at W4 and an angle of 90 degrees. So this is gonna be our uh, width. And for standard cars, we are gonna be designing for this measurement you will see module four at 90 degrees, that's gonna be 66 feet. So we're gonna have spaces for compact cars. Compact cars has a stall width of eight feet. That's the only measurement. So we're gonna use uh, for compact cars and module four at 90 degrees, 57 feet, two inches. That will be the width of the module. And for standard cars, their specification is eight feet, six inches for W4 and 90 degrees, we're gonna have 66 feet. So let me write that in here. Ninety degrees and W four. The module will be fifty seven feet and two inches. And for standard cars. also 90 degrees and using W4, the module width will be 66 feet 
zero inches. And now we're going to check to see if the depth of the lot, 200 feet, can accommodate a parking layout consisting of two modules of standard cars and one compact module. So 200 feet is our limitation, right? We need to make sure that if we're going to allocate one module for compact cars and the rest for standard cars, let's say two more to standard cars, that we have uh, that space is less than 200 feet, which is our limitation. So less than 200 feet. So two times 66 feet plus one time 57 feet and two inches is gonna be equal to 189 feet and two inches, which is less than 200. Okay, so we know that we can fit those three modules in the space because the uh, summation of the, the width is less than 200. Okay, so 189 feet and two inches is less than 200 feet. Therefore, the depth requirement is okay. Okay, so remember that we are designing for a facility space or space that has these dimensions. Two hundred and one eighty. So the first check that we did was, can we fit one module of compact cars and two modules of standard cars into this space? So we are looking at the depth because it's a higher or a bigger dimension. And what we are saying is, yes, based, based on our computations, we will have enough space to divide this into three. where we'll have one space for one area for compact cars and then two areas for standard cars. The question now is, okay, we can fit this based on where, but how many cars we can put inside those three spaces? So that's the next step. Each compact car module row will yield a car capacity based on the width of the lot, which is 180 feet, divided by the width requirement per stall, which is eight feet times the rows per module. Two. In half. Um, so, so basically, what we are saying is we have cars that are eight feet, or we're gonna, we are designing for, as we stated here, for compact cars with this width. And we have a width of 180 
and we're gonna have two lanes or two rows of parking spaces. So we're talking about compact here. So we are gonna be able to park on this side and also on this side. So those are the two lanes. So each compact module will have these two rows of, of parking spaces. And we are gonna compute the capacity based on these dimensions. So we're gonna have 180, that's the width, divided by eight, which is the space of or the width of the parking space. And then we're gonna multiply this times two because we're gonna have two lanes in that module. And this is gonna be equal to 44 potential compact cars. So based on that, we, we wanted 30, we had space for 44 so far. So with that module, we should be able to meet that requirement. We still have to do more because we have those uh, lanes that are needed for moving around the parking. So we are not done yet. So most likely we're gonna end up with lit spaces when we start designing for the flow uh, lanes. So similarly, each standard module row will yield a car capacity based on the width of the lot, which is 100 feet, 180 feet, divided by the width requirement per stall, which in this case is 8.5 feet, times the number of rows per module, which is two, times the number of modules. In this case, we have two. Yes. Oh, so 180 divided by eight is a fractional number, and then you're multiplied by two, you're gonna round down because you don't, if it is a fractional value, that means that you don't have enough space to add that extra space. Okay, good question. Everybody got that? So if you get 180.4.5.9, it doesn't matter. That 0.9 is telling you that you don't have enough space to add another. Uh, parking space, so you have to round down. Okay, so now we go into the, the next one. We do the same process, 180 divided by eight, but now by 8.5 times two, but in this case, we multiply times two again, because we have two modules for standard cars or we are designing for two modules uh, of, standard, of standard cars. So in here, we have two lanes, two lanes per module and two modules. So this is lanes and this is modules. In this case, we were designing for one module And this is the number of lanes per module. So we end up with 84 potential standard cars. So total possible equal to 44 plus 84 uh, spaces, which is equal to 128, which is greater than the required number. The required number was 100, so we have 28 more spaces. Therefore, module configuration W4 is feasible, a possible alternative of two rows mod per module times two standard modules and two rows per module town times one compact module for a total of six rows is the starting point for the layout. So we have to modify our layout now to account for the handicap requirement and the circulation reveals the following. 
So I'll define so far has in three modules, compact cars, standard cars, and two standard modules. And then in the compact uh, module, we want to account for the handicap spaces. So we're gonna take one of those rows, let's say row one, will handle all five handicap spaces. So the handicap spaces requires a 12 feet you have this here right here so 12 feet plus minus 12 feet so that's the the width that is going to be required for the handicap Okay, so 12 feet. So we have to design for that width. And we need five spaces. So it's five times 12, which is equal to 60 feet. And we are gonna accommodate those five spaces in the first row. So the remaining space will be occupied by standard cards. So that will be 180 minus 60 divided by 8.5. That will be 14 spaces. So one of the lanes, we are redesigning one of the lanes to accommodate the handicapped spaces. And then we're saying, okay, we're gonna put these five spaces here for handicap and the rest of the space for that lane, we're gonna use it for standard cars. So that space that is remaining, we're gonna be able to put 14 spaces. Um, so now we need some circulation lanes. So we need to adjust some of the rows. So row adjusting for two, circulation lanes of 15 feet each. So for some of these lanes, we will have to readjust um, for circulation space. So if we go back to our design, we have three modules and we are saying you have spaces here you have spaces here, here, and here. So for those lanes, we have to leave some space for circulation. However, for the lanes on the sides, we don't have to leave any space. 
So that's what we are going to do now. For this lane, this lane, this lane, and this lane, we need to do some readjusting to allow for circulation. And we need to leave 15 feet on each side. Okay, so it's gonna be gonna be here and here is gonna be fifteen feet and also from here to here another fifteen feet. So in general, I mean, when we look at both sides, we have to take out 30 feet for each one of these lanes. So for roads adjusting for the circulation lanes, we do the following computation. We have 180, that's this dimension right here, 180 feet. So 180 minus, 15 feet times two, all that divided by 8.5 feet, that will be 17 spaces. So what, mean, what that means is from here to here, we will have 17 spaces. Row three and four will yield the same number of spaces So we're calling this two, three, and four. This is for compact. So two, three, and four, we belong to our standard cars. We'll have the same number of cars in between. So row three and four will yield the same number of spaces. However, this is going to be five and six. Row five will have one hundred and eighty minus thirty divided by eight equal 18 spaces. So this part right here, that is 18 spaces. And row six, we'll handle 180, divided by eight, 22 spaces. So this one right here, 22 spaces. Okay, so let's summarize this. So we have six, 17 spaces here. No, this is 17, this is 17. This one has 17. This one will have 18. This one will have 22. Um, and then for this one, we are 
Uh, we have five spaces that are handicapped. And 14 that are normal. So in total, we have five plus 14 plus 17 plus 17 plus 17 plus 18 plus 22. And we have that computation on the next slide. So this will be our final design. You see, we were using W4. W4, you remember, has a walk uh, aisle. So we wanted that walk aisle, aisle in this design. So that's what you are observing here. You have a walk aisle, another walk aisle here. And here is where you have the handicap, the five spaces and the 14 standard cars, another 17 standard cars, 17 standard cars here, 17 standard cars here, and then the module for the compact cars that fits 18 and 22 at the top. So as a summary, we have the total number of spaces. We were designing for a hundred, but we end up with 40 compact spaces, 65 standard spaces, and five handicaps for a total of 110 spaces, which is a little more than when we need it. And this is just one design. We can revise this design using a different type of module and see if we wanted to fit more, we can do that. But for the specifications of this problem, meaning that 100 spaces with uh, at least 30 compact cars, we got 40 and five handicapped spaces, we were able to fit that in that space. Questions? Okay, so there's a lot in the in Canvas. I think what I what I want to do is to give you the opportunity to work on that problem before we leave today. Um, so I'm going to open that file here. So at least you get it started. So basically, I am asking you to design a parking lot with these dimensions, 400 feet wide by 370 feet deep. And I want you to tell me how many standard car size cars fit in this lot using W2 module. So in this lab, I'm not asking you to include the um, Handicap, I'm not asking you to include compact cars, it's just for standard cars using W2 module. So I want you to tell me how many cars you can fit in, in this module with a W2 in this space with the W2 module. And obviously you have to also include the uh, flow links. Uh, as we did for the for the example in class. Um, so if you if you want to write this down somewhere in a piece of paper, so I can show some of the tables that you will need in case you don't you don't have the information with you. So again, the dimensions are 400 feet wide, 370 feet deep, and you're going to use a W2 module. 
And the question is how many standard cars you can fit in, in this space. So this is the um, the information in terms of the space that will be needed. Now, instead of using a module four, you're going to be using a module two. So uh, for module two, we are not specifying the, the angle. So you can design for 90 degrees as we did in the, in the example. So it's gonna be 66. And then in this, you have two dimensions, um, depending on how you, the direction that you use if you're going to be aligning the lanes according to the deep or the or the width the, the, the design is going to be different So here we have, uh, we're gonna design for standard cars, 90 degrees W2 module with a width of 66. So again, they determine how many modules the lot of the parking lot can handle. So in this case, again, if you see my, my design, Instead of looking at the 400 feet, I'm looking at the 370 feet to design this parking. If you go the other, if you use the other uh, dimension, that's fine too. I think you will be able to accommodate more spaces if you use the 400 instead of the 370. How do you make a decision? in terms of how do you go in terms of the direction of the lanes, it will be based on the access road. So if you, if, if you have an access road that goes in this direction, um, you wanna make sure that your lanes, um, typically you will have your lanes in, in this perpendicular form where the access road is. So if you go the other way, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's just a different design. Questions? Any questions? So based on my design, I was able to get 5.6. What this is telling me is that I can feed five modules and a half. So one of those modules will have cars only on one side. And then the rest is very straightforward. Uh, you, you design for the flow lanes, making sure that you have 15 feet on both sides of the lane for circulation. And then based on that, you know how many cars you can fit in each 
one of those lanes that are in the middle. And then, you know, the ones on the sides, you don't have to adjust those. So you will have the whole lane with parking spaces. But the ones in the middle, you have to adjust for circulation lanes. Fifteen on both sides. Yes, always fifteen. Yes. No, even even if he doesn't ask for it, you you need those. Yes. Because you know you're not, not going to have a separate entrance for each lane. You take one, one entrance and everybody has to flow through that entrance. Yes, we round down the number of modules. But in this case, in my solution, I got 5.6. So I can at least get 5.5 .5 or five and a half modules into this design. Yes, it's six, but you see there's only spaces on one side of the of the mod. So that's what I'm I'm referring to as a half a module because I don't have enough space to put two lanes in that module. Uh, yes, I mean, drawing the, the parking lot will allow you to see where to place the, or at least know where you're going to have uh, the circulation lanes uh, affecting your design. So for me, drawing is important in the sense of making sure that you are uh, designing the right number of spaces according to the location of the 
uh, circulation lanes. So if you see in my in my drawing here, I have um, five complete modules and one half of a module at the top. Um, so by this drawing, I can I can see. I mean, I made those red lines just to illustrate the modules that will the lanes that will have parking on both faces, and then I'm using blue to make sure that. Uh, in that module, I'm representing only one lane. Um, so the drawing is, is there mostly for, for making sure that I, I account for the right number of spaces. And then I'm using those green lines green lines to show where the circulation lanes will be changing the number of spaces in the parking lot. So those green lanes are green lines are telling me you have to cut this lane on both sides because we need to provide space for circulation. And each lane or you have to leave 15 15 feet on each end of the of the lane for circulation purpose. Are there any questions from you guys here? Yeah, so I'll, I'll let you complete the, the exercise on your own. Make sure that you submit that document for midnight tonight. Um, I think at this point, the only thing you have to do is to make sure that you count the, the right number of spaces uh, based on that width of 5.6, or I'm sorry, 8.5 feet. Using the 400. So I'm gonna stop now and we will meet again on Monday.